God is a God who loves you. He cares for you. He wants to do great things in your life. Just open up and he'll do those things. Welcome to Hope Today. I'm Tom Hollis. I'm here with Amy Schaefer. And Amy, God is that God that wants to, he wants to get inside, do great things in us. Isn't that the greatest thing about him? He is what we call a good father. And I was thinking about how, honestly, I think we're guilty of spoiling our children. Buck and I were kind of talking yesterday about things we wish we maybe had done <laughs> different because, you know, now that we're kind of in the ditch of entitlement or, or whatever. And I'm thinking, if we being evil, Tom, not a good gift. know how to give good gifts to our kids, yeah. imagine our Heavenly Father, how He just wants to lavish you today with joy and peace and acceptance. And just know today that you really are His beloved. And that's something that we can stand firm in, Tom. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I think is so great about God is when He says He's a Father to us. He's not just using an analogy. He's really our Father. He's really the one who wants to give us those good gifts. Well, today we're going to hear from a missionary uh, to Egypt, Adam Trimber, that's going to tell us about the things that are going on there in that country. Sydney had a chance to sit down with him earlier. And just you're going to hear about the things that God is doing right there in one of the most ancient nations. I mean, there are, you know, God has plans for each nation. And sometimes the nation doesn't follow. Like, I don't know that America is following the plan the way God would, would want right now. Wow. But he has a plan for Egypt. He has a plan for every nation, just like he has a plan for people. It's easy to get small minded. I think, Tom, you know, as you're, you, you know, you live in your little city, in your little community, and you go to your little church, and <clears throat> we're in America, we're in Pennsylvania, or whatever. And it's like, there's a great big world out there that Jesus died for that God loves. God loves the whole world. And Egypt in particular is very near and dear to our hearts. You know, uh, our church has funded churches and ministries all over Egypt. So the Egyptians are very precious in our hearts. We hold them close. And the stories, the miraculous stories of Jesus showing up in Muslims' yeah. rooms and, um, you know, the supernatural, supernatural yeah. stories of Jesus revealing himself yeah. to that country and to that nation. And my favorite one was um, a man that was head over one of the huge parts of the Muslim world. And he woke up in the night and a finger had written a phone number no on the kidding. wall. So it he, wasn't the cornerstone <laughs> prayer line, was it? <laughs> that was so good. I'm, job. I'm, well, anyway. <laughs> he gets up shaking. He calls the number and it was a pastor in Egypt. Wow. Wow. This man, powerful, influential, Jesus radically transformed his life and everyone under his sphere of influence, their lives have changed. So wow. let's be expecting those kinds of things to happen um, today in That's this right. time. Absolutely, and we wanna expect those things for you too. We always have prayer partners that are available. They're standing by and they're able and willing and they want to pray for you. That's their job, that's their purpose, that's their ministry is to pray for you. So the number's on your screen. You can call there, you can get prayer, and you can see God do a miraculous thing in your life. Whatever you're requesting, make your request known to God. What's even better is he reveals himself to you, he reveals who he is to you, and does uh, exceeding abundantly beyond all we ask or think. Well, we're gonna take a short break. When we return in 60 seconds, Sydney is joined by missionary Adam Trimber, and he's gonna share how he's spreading the word in Egypt. We'll be right back. think of the New Testament disciples, it's easy to idealize their walk with God, but they were just like you and me. They needed a great deal of help to stay on the right path. We're excited to announce that Tom Hollis has a new devotional coming out this June. Spirit Walk follows the apostles as they attempt to follow Christ, as reflected through the book of Acts. Their experiences can be ours as well. All we need to do is follow the Spirit. Enjoy 40 short devotional entries and discover how the journey of the apostles relates to us today. 
Spirit Walk includes a daily verse, prayer, and space to journal your personal reflections. Be among the first to receive Tom's devotional, which releases June 12th. Ask for your copy of Spirit Walk when you give today. Call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for your generosity. Hope happens here. Adam, we are so grateful you are joining us today. And you know, as I understand, you know, you are homegrown, you're from this area and God has called you to the Middle East. But before we get there and what God has called you to do now, can you talk to us about the beginning of your story here in the Pittsburgh area? Sure, I grew up, I grew up north of Butler, Pennsylvania in a place called West Sunbury. I went to Monotel School District. And uh, you know, I just, I loved science from the beginning. And when I went to college, I apparently, I, here's the funny part, I didn't pay attention to my, my biology class, so I wanted to do something outside. So I chose environmental science biology. And shortly after a couple classes into, into college, I realized that biology wasn't the best option because I really wanted outdoors. But that played a significant role in, in getting to where I needed to be, uh, where God was calling me to be. That's awesome. So you have a passion for being on the outside outdoors and mm -hmm. God didn't call you necessarily to medicine, but he had a greater call for you to be a pastor. So can you talk to us mm -hmm. about your spiritual journey? How did you come to know Jesus? I grew up in the church. My mom took me to church every Sunday, but I think that was more of a, if I could use the word, like a cultural experience of attending. And maybe it was a, a the place that I was in life, but um, I don't ever recall really understanding or knowing who Jesus really was and what he meant to me. And I was attending Creation Fest, which is out in Shiresburg, Pennsylvania, one, one year. And I think that was 2011. And I remember listening to Paul Bullish under a worship tent and talking about what it really meant to know Jesus. And I remember sitting there, you know, tears were just coming out of my eyes. I was bawling and, and leaning there. And I realized that I'd never once accepted Jesus into my heart. And that's where I accepted Jesus into my life. I can even see the tears coming up for you like right now as you're sharing that. And so what would you say like what when you had that experience and that encounter with him, what does that mean for you? Oh, it was, you know, it's like somebody that you love and respect wrapping their arms around you and the, the absolute feeling of peace and comfort and joy and that all, like your past was almost dissolved away and that you have a some you, you have a like a best friend somebody walking with you through every part of life that is so true that i love that he is our friend he is with mm -hmm. us every step of the way and so from that experience that encounter that you had at creation fest mm -hmm. and you went off to school mm -hmm. and what did you study in college so I ended up studying environmental science, sorry, um, earth science education is what it ended up being. And so that was to be a middle school teacher for general science and ultimately earth science as well. And did you become a teacher? I did, I became a teacher. I got hired in West Virginia, in, in Hedgesville, West Virginia. And that was my first teaching assignment. And um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. <laughs> so tell us, so you started off as a teacher in the classroom, but there was a definite shift. So tell us how God shifted you out of the classroom into preaching and being a pastor. Sure, I loved Sunday evenings at church. I loved hearing, we would have guest speakers, we have global workers come in, and I always had this warm and fuzzy feeling in my heart. So I knew God was calling me to something. And one day after school, I was listening to uh, Money Matters and Adventures in Odyssey, and the kids had already left, fortunately, and I found myself just bawling my eyes out. That God, like it was a Holy Spirit moment in the classroom. And that's where I knew God was calling me to something. So how did you, like, what did that next process and that step look like for you to become a pastor? Well, I met with a young adult pastor because I had no idea what that meant and determined that I had to go back to school and that ended up being seminary. But I had just bought a house and I didn't know, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. And the short version is that God told me to sell my house and resign from my teaching position effective the end of the year and go to school. And that was a huge step to resign from my job effective the end of the year before I had sold my house. And, but the Lord provided every step away to get to seminary so I could study uh, theology in order to become a pastor. Well, Adam, you know what I love about your story is that there was that complete surrendering moment mm -hmm. where you're like, I'm just giving this all 
to you, Jesus. And that can be a really hard place to be. But Absolutely. like you said, he provided every step mm -hmm. of the way. And talk to us about like you met your wife and you both were called to a greater <laughs> mission. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay. So I attended a church in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia, Bethel, Assemblies of, Bethel, Bethel Assembly of God, Martinsburg. And at the time, her father was a pastor about 45 minutes south in Winchester, Virginia. So our young adult groups would do things together. And when we first met, it was not love at first sight. I had jet blue hair and she was heading back overseas and we went our separate ways. And we reconnected years later over Facebook living in separate countries. That is so beautiful. Like when you said the blue hair, I couldn't even imagine <laughs> with blue hair. That is awesome. And so tell us about, you know, you and your wife, you're together and mm -hmm. now you are called to go to the Middle East. So tell us about that journey and how God led you both there. Sure. So we were actually leading a team to Egypt. And at that stage of my life, I'll be honest with you, that we were living in America at the time, uh, doing ministry in America, and I had no desire to go back overseas because my parents were about to retire and I wanted to spend more time with them. And I, I gave the Lord four like, fleeces, basically. I said that you have to give me a love to study Arabic. You have to give me a, a desire, like a burning desire to go back to uh, the Middle East. You have to give me a desire to to want to finish my degree at seminary, which I hadn't finished so I could become a pastor. And he did all of that sitting in that meeting. And so the, the Lord spoke to each of us individually in that meeting in Egypt to come back to Egypt to continue doing what we're currently doing. And because that's where we've been called, we're just, we're love, you know, we're just so joy filled to be able to work with the church in Egypt. Beautiful. I love how God does that. He will just confirm it over and mm -hmm. over again and let you know, like, son, this is the way I am calling you to mm -hmm. walk. So tell us a little bit about, you know, Egypt and the life that you have there. I mean, I, we hear about sometimes in the news about mm -hmm. things here in Egypt, but tell us, give us a little sense of what it's like over there. Well, first, we love it. We yeah. absolutely love it. We love that that we get to work there, we get to live there. Uh, we work with the above ground church with the Assemblies of God there. Uh, the people are wonderful. I mean, if you, if you visited Egypt, you know, you walk the streets and probably in the, in the same day, the first day there, you would get invited for tea or for coffee or to join a wedding or whatnot. They're open, they love learning about God. And we just absolutely love serving the church to encourage, empower and equip them to help them become what God has called them to be. I love that so much is that God has called you from America into that place of Egypt mm -hmm. and just to love on the people. And Adam, I just mm -hmm. want to ask you, what is God speaking to your spirit in this season? We really want to encourage the church. We want, we want to help them see that what is written in the Bible is true. I mean, like they love Jesus, they love worshiping and everything, but, but I think there's a disconnect sometimes on really trusting that, you know, down to the provision side. Because if you're living in a country and you have very little, sometimes it's hard to be generous. Sometimes it's hard to, to actually tithe or, or to give to the church in different ways. And so we want, we're trying to teach them that, that God will provide, that through every pound given, through every amount given, that God will provide their every single need. Need. And we're seeing we're seeing churches begin to to do that. We're seeing churches beginning to to give generously, and the Lord meets their every needs. And and that is such a beautiful season to see churches grow in generosity for for the work of ministry. I think that's beautiful, just showing that generosity, that love, that outpouring. Because mm -hmm. God, He is truly a giver. Mm -hmm. Adam, thank you so much for sharing your story and just the journey. Truly fascinating and remarkable. And thank you for all you're doing. For thank the you. kingdom of God in Egypt. Thank you. Well, what a great conversation that uh, Sydney had there with uh, with Adam. And uh, you know, I, I just think, Amy, about a country like Egypt. We relate Egypt scripturally a lot of times with going back to Egypt and right. persecution and all these things, and and even later the the wrong alliances with Egypt and all of this. But I love what God says in Isaiah 19. It's one of my favorite, it's, it's just, I, I love this, where he says, he says, um, in that day, Israel will be a third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. 
look, this is not what we normally think of when we think of Assyria or Egypt. You know, Assyria, of course, was the one that conquered uh, Israel later. And, but I have to say, God has a, a desire to draw all people to himself. And even those enemies, he draws to himself. Egypt is a huge part of our biblical history. Mm -hmm. um, and Moses, and it's, Jesus um, even was taken to Egypt right. uh, when he was a young child. And Egypt is very prominent in the scriptures. Egypt is also considered the Middle East where you will have, just like in Israel, Muslims, Jew, uh, Christians dwelling together, mostly Muslims and Coptic Christians, as they would call them in Egypt. You know, the Coptic Christians, Tom, will have um, the cross tattooed on their wrist so that if or when they die for their faith, they will get a Christian burial. Wow. Um, but it's so important to realize because right now all eyes are on Israel. I was just reading a story about the ICC. It's the International Criminal Court. Have you heard about this? No. The inter we don't know where the International Criminal Court comes from, who is funding them, who, but they are saying now that they're going to arrest top Israeli government officials, mm. which means this ICC group, whoever they are, wherever they came from, could go and arrest the elite in any top government in the mm. world. I mean, it's, it, it's very concerning. Um, of course, we know that there's bombs in Israel, there's, there's war in Israel, there's Gaza, there's the Palestinians. Um, right now in America, on many, many United States college campuses, there are um, protests breaking out, there are I mean, I saw one clip where kids are holding up an American flag and they're getting pelted by, um, you know. Right, yeah. It's, it's just crazy. And I think, what, I think what spurred that big fight on our campuses was, you know, the U.S. government um, passing a bill to, I think, $26 billion to support Israel. Right, yeah. So people are just freaking out and flared out, which... From a Christian perspective, we do support Israel. Yes, we do support Israel. Of course, from a Christian perspective also, we know that God loves the Palestinians yes, and war is absolutely. terrible. War is terrible business. Uh, and and it, though, uh, uh, you know, I understand Israel's point in wanting to end Hamas and all of, all of that situation. Yep. But where is God in all this? Right. Well, God has that heart for obviously he loves Israel, he defends Israel, but God has that heart for all people that he would draw even Egypt, that he would draw even Assyria, uh, uh, Jordan uh, to him. And that, that in, in the end times that right. there will be this, this coming together. Uh, and, and Amy, you were sharing about how the miraculous way some people are meeting Christ yes. in Egypt. God wants that. He wants to pour out upon them. But what does that mean for you? Well, uh, no matter where you're at or where your family is at, where your family members are, God has a plan and purpose to draw you together and to draw you together to follow him. It's not so we'll have good times at Christmas <laughs> when we get together. It's so that we will love one another and love the Lord God and really see what he uh, wants to do in, in everyone's life, not just in our own little little area, but in all of our lives. So we have a scripture for you. It, it's, uh, you know. Uh, we, Before we go on, yeah. can I mention one more thing about Egypt? Because sure. my husband's been there like maybe 25 times. That's amazing. We're very invested in the churches and the Bible schools in Egypt. Egypt is a great lesson though for Christians because Egypt used to be 80% Coptic Christian right. nation. And what happened was the church got silent and just stopped witnessing, stopped evangelizing. And then the Muslim religion came and overpowered the Coptic Christian. So yeah. I think that now is not the time in the world to be ashamed of the gospel. No. Oh no, we're not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. And so I declare a decree that our nation is a Christian nation, that we follow Christ. We are a sheep nation 
and follow the shepherd. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Well, uh, we're going to hear about probably from the, the greatest evangelist at all time, of all time, the Apostle Paul, who was all about spreading the gospel around. And he said this in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Mm -hmm. It, we don't exactly know, it's a messenger from Satan to buffet him. It says yeah. that we don't exactly know what that was for sure, but uh, it was Christ saying, I will be strong in your weak times. Yes. Do you have another version on that? I do have another version because it is so good. I highlighted it in pink. <laughs> if it's so profound, it goes pink in my little matches Bible. Your, it matches would match my jacket. Yeah. Listen to this in the Passion Translation. But he answered me, my grace is always more than enough for you. My grace is always more than enough for you. And my power finds its full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses for when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So I'm not defeated by my weakness, but I'm delighted. And listen to this, for when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side, when I face persecution because of my love for Christ, I am made yet even stronger. Here's the key, Tom. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. For my weakness becomes a portal for God's power. Isn't that awesome? My weakness becomes a portal. It is a wide open door for God's power to show up in my life, when I am weak, then I am strong. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What you, my grace is sufficient for you. So today, man, you've been struggling, you've been pushing, you've been working, you've been earning, but maybe today it's time to just step back and say, you know what? I have got some extreme weaknesses. There are some faults, there are some cracks in the line. And I, this is a wide open door. It's a wide open portal for God's power to come in and shine in my life. Maybe in your marriage relationship, there's a big crack. There's a big wide open portal of weakness. Just say, God, I need your power. I need your forgiveness to shine through this life. I'm telling you, Tom, if we would get some of these scriptures, just chew on them and chew on them, they could change our whole life. Well, it's even Paul is getting to know Christ here, right? Even Paul who met Christ on, in a blinding light and had miraculous things happening and was preaching the gospel all around, he came to the place where even in his uh, great strength, Paul's strength, he couldn't do something. And he realized that he needed that power of the Holy Spirit, that power of, of God coming through him. You need that right now. You need that today. Whatever that weakness is that Amy was talking about, whatever it is, God can enter into that. You know, when you're a little kid and you're trying to move something, you're trying to build something, you're trying to, you just can't seem to get it going, you know, and, and your dad comes over and he just picks it up like nothing or he just puts it together like nothing. Uh, and that's because his strength, his power, his wisdom, his understanding is so much better than the child's. And that's the same way it is with God yes. for you. So you can't figure your way out. You don't understand how to be reconciled to that family member that you've broken relationship right. 20 years ago. You don't know how to do that. God knows how to do it. Right. You don't know how to uh, maybe have a right relationship with a neighbor. You don't know how to overcome some besetting sin that seems to always drag you down or some lifestyle choice that is always dragging you down. God is able today. You know what, we didn't really plan to go here with this program today, but God is able to bring you to that place. He's got this message for you today that something will change in that, in you today. Open your life to him today. And we started by saying at the beginning of the program, he's a good father. Mm -hmm. 
He's a good shepherd. And, and my husband and I were talking as we are now raising, you know, young adults and older teenagers. And it's like. I thought you were going to say sheep that you're raising sheep. We're sheep. raising teenage sheep <laughs> is right. You know, and where there is sheep, there is poo. <laughs> but listen, we don't expect them to be perfect. They're 19 years old, 24 years old. They don't have it all figured out. They are going to make mistakes. The 16 year old, he's going to say something dumb. They're going to do something <laughs> dumb. We do not expect them to be perfect. We remember ourselves at 19 years old and oh, yes. early 20s. Oh, it's yes. like, dear God, thank God for his grace that was sufficient for you. So if you think for a second that God is expecting you to be perfect, do it all right, never make mistakes, never have a weakness, you're mistaken. He's a good father and truly today his grace is sufficient for you. And I just want to take a moment to encourage pastors. I'm glad for your education. I'm glad for your learning, your studies. But even for you, God's power is what matters. God's power. And I know so many pastors are going through struggles and difficulties. And maybe we'll just take a moment to, to pray if we could right now. So I've got a pastor sitting right next to me here. And yes. just we just, yes. for all pastors, we just stand yes. and believe, God, that Thank you want to do mighty things in them yes. and change. And, and, and Lord, bring your power, uh, bring your strength, bring your wisdom, bring everything that they need yes. to them today. They, they might be uh, strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, you are a great and faithful God, and we just trust and believe you're going to do great things in our pastors and in everyone who's watching. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And we just have a special thing we want to share with you before we leave. If you would like to win tickets to see Amy Grant, I mean, who doesn't want to do that? Win tickets to see Amy Grant in concert May 14th. Go to cv, ctvn.org slash contest to enter. You'll have to answer a trivia question there and uh, be put in, if you get them right, be put in to uh, win those tickets. It'll be a good time. And remember that anytime you need anything, you need prayer, you need encouraging word, you need somebody just to agree with you, call us. We're here for you. May God write it on the walls of your heart, 888-665-4483. And we wish you the most blessed, best day ever. And we'll see you tomorrow on Hope Today. On tomorrow's Hope Today, stand firm and strong as you walk in Christ's victory for your everyday life. Best-selling author and intercessory leader James W. Gall offers biblical teaching on how to combat the attacks from the enemy so you can walk in victory. That's tomorrow on Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.